So I'd like to call to order this uh, Board of Ed special meeting on July 28th and invite you to please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Great. Okay, I'm up. So I, I remember I had this lapel mic on. I have sort of my loud, booming teacher voice, and when I get really excited and animated, my voice gets louder and louder. So I will do my best not to deafen you during this segment here. So we're going to talk about goal setting. And as I said, we decided to come into an open session to have this conversation so we can talk more candidly about the district at large and to kind of engage in some activities around you know, your district. And where I always like to start this conversation off around goal setting is with the notion that this still doesn't work. <laughs> oh, there we go. The notion that successful leaders live life backwards. So what do you guys think that means? They, they live life backwards. In other words, then, then what's the starting point? What do you think? End in mind. The ah, the end, right? The end result. What is it that we're trying to accomplish? And, and, and that's a vision, all right? A vision is what do we aspire to become? A vision is different from a mission. A mission is why do we exist? Vision, on the other hand, is what do we aspire to become within the system? Now, I wish this worked better because it's messing up my flow. Now, you guys went through a process in which you developed a vision. Your vision is unique, and to be honest with you, I've never seen a vision like yours per se, and that is not a criticism by any stretch of the imagination. Typically, when I see a vision, it's a very short, truncated statement of, you know, what it is it that if they fulfilled all their hopes and dreams, what would it become? I like your vision because it's broken down under the notion of the whole child, and it's put into three different buckets. 21st century knowledge and skills, global citizenship, social and emotional, well, be physical well-being. And when you look at a vision, having a vision is all great. But according to the old futurist, that a vision without action is a dream. Action without vision is a nightmare. <laughs> vision with action has the potential to change the world. And so you've already taken steps already in which you've gone out with a community survey and you've developed a process in which you've developed sort of these vision and then aligned to those vision, it articulates in terms of how you're going to quote unquote achieve that. And what I'm gonna have you uh, do in just a second here is I'm gonna have Dr. Blanche come up and talk about well what was the process that was undertaken in order to develop this success plan that you currently have. From there, I'm gonna break you guys down into the small groups that you were in, and there's two main questions that I'm gonna have you guys discuss within your small groups. What do we like about the development process that was undertaken? And then on the flip side of that, what was missing from that process, or what would you like to see included in that process? Because that's gonna help us in our conversation as we move forward. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Blanche. Great, thanks, Jamie. I'm all good, I got this one on. You're okay. Yeah, thank you, sir. <clears throat> See if this works, Jamie. <laughs> All right, so I'll go ahead. We'll probably about 10 or 15 minutes just walk this uh, piece through. So as Jamie was saying, we're reconnecting. So roughly 12 years ago when I landed here, um, we had uh, multiple, multiple conversations across the community, uh, faculty, staff, uh, board membership at that time dissipated. Uh, everybody that we could get. So we took a good six to nine months to bring all that information and, and develop what Jane was speaking about earlier. We'll look at a little bit more here. Um, last summer, we kind of went back in particular after, hopefully as we're walking out of COVID, reconnecting to those mission and vision uh, ideals that we've established for our district. So last summer in this very room, our collective board, our entire administration council team spent a good portion of that retreat to actually going back and looking at the mission and those vision and the goals. And we started talking a little bit more specifically about the learner profile for a student. 
when they're in the school and what, what that means to be a graduate, a Tusker graduate from the school. And so we spent more time looking at that. So that's an added value we put in there. After we met, we had Tusker University conversation with Open That Up to Community. That was a piece that we had done uh, last fall. Uh, we also went out to the Billings, same Miller conversation, some of the piece so folks can reconnect to this work, recommit. And then also we kind of closed the end of the year where we met with our students at the high school with their Senate group, about 50 or so kids over there, kind of went through the same process and brought that forth and kind of recommitted to this work. And so when we think about that, again, one of the pieces that really hasn't changed is this idea about our uh, mission. And so when we think about where we are, oops, sorry. <laughs> See what you mean, I think. So the why we exist is what Jamie was saying before. This idea about why do we exist? Well, we're gonna ignite the passion each student by engaging students at a personal level to ensure success in that global society. So this is the conversation, this is the work that came over hundreds of conversations and ultimately landed us in here. So short but tight, what will we do? We are gonna ignite the passion for whom? In each student by doing what? What are we going to do? We're going to engage kids. We're going to engage students. And how are we going to do that? We're going to do it at a personal level. To what end? To help them ensure success in global society. So it's short, it's tight. Again, I've seen many of them. I prefer the brevity here. Uh, very crisp and very clear of what we're looking at doing in here. So then, as much as we talk about why do we exist and say, how do we want to exist? How do we want this to in, in, translate into kind of action pieces in our, in our school district? And so before we get into that, what I was hoping we can do, and I think you saw it's kind of one of the questions Jamie's got coming up. What is your current understanding of the goal setting process? And that's where we're going to carry. So you should have an administrator at each one of the tables there. And it's going to be really short. I'm going to just ask them to take some notes. But basically, what's your current understanding of what the goal setting process is? Then we'll walk through the process. And then at the end, I'm going to ask them to reflect. Man, so now what's your current understanding? So this is where I'm at, and here's my new understanding. Any questions? Just, again, just a couple minutes there. What's your current understanding of that? So I'll turn it back to the table talk. All right, this one is for you too. Current understanding of the goals. How the process of setting those goals and the reaction and the, and the uh, success plans and the related uh, evidence out of that. So how does that process take place? Is it just race in an office? And doing this, or what, what's the process involved in that? So it's more than process, it's also what our role is as different stakeholders in this district. And you could certainly put that right in there. What do you see your roles is, and what's like your current understanding of how those goals are set? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and pull back together again. Hopefully, add enough to at least get a few thoughts down on uh, paper just about your current understanding of the goal development and structure in a district, so we'll, we'll kind of come back to that, just enough of a start. We answer the question. Uh, yeah, and there is no wrong, it's just to gotta get the relationship uh, going. You may hear that a few times today, so. <laughs> so, yes, it all, that's what you will, you will definitely uh, hear that for sure. So here's those three elements of the buckets. So that short, you know, kind of vision statement that like Jamie mentioned before about how do we want to be? We desire to be a school district where a child's learning experiences, they are grounded in the development of the whole child. That's, that's how we want to exist, a place where we're, we're constantly looking and behaving and operating by thinking about the whole student. You can't have one without all the elements. And what are those elements? From our work with our vision and mission setting, we've defined that. We've defined that into those three large buckets, 21st century knowledge, global, and social, emotional, and physical wellness. And then we actually took that to the next layer, and we spent some time and really zoomed in on that and identified, well, what does that mean? And so specifically, those are the 21st century knowledge things that we need, and some of those skills, the creativity, the compassion, the caring. So we spent time, and that language, and all that work kind of came out of all those multiple engagement sessions. Then we drilled it down, so what do we mean by social, emotional, and physical wellness? Well, this is what we mean. Self-awareness and self-management, relationship skills, social awareness. That's the specificity that we've, we've really talked about. This is what we mean. Because that, that, that we talked a little bit before about um, clarity is kindness. And we're trying to be as clear as we can with our communication pieces in here. And so with this next piece, 
Third bucket there is global citizen. Well, what does that mean to be a global citizenship in Somer School District? Collaborating with others in diverse backgrounds, developing self-awareness, empathy, and appreciation, giving back to the local and global community. So those are the specific elements that we say, okay, this is what we're talking about when we say global citizen. And so with that piece set where, again, you think about now how and what are we committed to as a professional and learning community, our team, our faculty came together and identified these are the things that we believe in how we'll operate. What does it look like? We're going to support that personalized learning in the middle there. So you think about personalized learning, well, what, what does it mean to be a personalized learning? Example, students learn to set goals. Adults with a school will model and benefit from strong professional and student relationships. Students will be, uh, as they pursue increasingly independent pathways, we want to engage parents and teachers to become guides and mentors. Think about our mentoring program and things. All of that is generated and driven by the work that we've identified here in our, in our expansive uh, dis uh, description of our vision. This piece now we spent, this is kind of our recommitment and our reconnection to the mission and vision is, well, what's the profile of a student that we would say would be in Somers that looking for? These are the elements, that's actually some of the board narrative that we spent last year on our retreat. And then as we look at, here are those elements of the learner profile that we have really come uh, to basically adopt in the district. As we look at the DB program at the high school, now many years program here, and ninth and 10th grade, those elements of that learner profile, and we spent time talking and identifying, well, what does that mean and what's the information we'll see around those areas. Next piece here is just thinking about as a professional collaborative team, that, that circle around there, that's the intended to give it strength, our diagram and our purpose, strength and rigidity. These are the driving questions that drive our work throughout any layer of the organization. Basically from Rick DeFore's work on professional learning communities, what do we want our students to know and be able to do? That's a clarity of conversation down to the grade level, down to the course level, thinking about state standards and thinking about what it looks like in our curriculum mapping software, so that clearly defines what we're looking for. How do we know students know and able to understand? That's our assessment system. So our, our formative assessment, our comprehensive assessment, our internal, our external assessment, it's that balanced assessment system that gives us the understanding about how do we know. And what do we do when students don't know or aren't able to do something? How do we intervene and support additional supports? And then what do we do if students already are, are doing well and need to move forward? You can think about, uh, Stacey, you may remember, is it seven years now, six years? We brought on our advanced learning program. And so that is in direct response to that of children who are uh, really doing well, really screwed on, we put in an advanced learning program with dedicated faculty and staff to support those kids who are moving in that direction. So where does all of this come from? I just want to go back to the beginning. These are our district slash community slash board slash SOMERS goals. You notice they're in our three buckets. We will ensure the intellectual growth and development in all learners. That's the drive that comes through. That's the directing our excellence. Is what our tagline is forward and excellence. That came again out of visioning process. So when you think about that first one, this is the work that drives everything, these three goals. The next one, we will nurture social, emotional, and physical wellness in all learners. That is the goal that is set and established at the district or at the board level, community level. And the last one is we will foster growth as global citizens and all learners that you will see cascade itself through the entirety of the organization across the board. And so when you look at this and we think, okay, so now if this is giving guidance and direction, this is the destination we determine, this is the ideas that we're looking at, this is our goal to be in these three areas, that's established at the board level. Then as we think about, okay, so now how do we drive that excellence? So the driving, the engine behind here now are these mechanisms now you see added to that graph. So again, basically when you look at where we were before, there's the elements, and then now as we think about how do we go ahead and drive that forward, you can see that now what's coming forward are the operational sides. Administrators, teacher leaders, teachers, community, those are the folks that are involved in driving this. How does that happen? You see the district success plan, and the bottom success plan from the, each school. And then you have those team SMART goals. So when you think about this, I'll describe it as really procedural, uh, operational goals that you're looking at, that we're looking at going ahead and implementing. Hey guys. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you talked to my children, have you? <laughs> and so, um, when you think about really two goals, so one, we're looking at a goal area that 
that uh, the board set those guiding goals, and then in the in one area, procedural goals, process goals, um, we're looking at, and then as we look at um, results-driven goals. So we, ha we have two of those areas. So in essence, in these first set of goals, the district success plan, you'll see now they're guiding the schools, these success plans, and their smart goal development. So those are, they're both there, they're both necessary, yet they are different. And so you will see some specific goal areas that would be driven uh, by the um, success plan out in the schools. So if you look at something like here, and so from a process perspective, we're looking at increasing our capacity, a capacity piece. How can we get better at this work? And this work is about really effective tier one implementation of the classroom. Great, so that's a piece we're talking about from procedural piece to having that conversation and driving that forward. Then the building, there's obviously other ones in here, but um, time, then the building will pick that up and then they will take that and then now make that a building specific procedural piece. So now what they're gonna be looking at doing, they're looking at their best practices specific to ELA and mathematics, so they're notching that down to the next level. Then, as we'll see here, they've identified, now what's the body of evidence? What's the information we have to see? Because the end result is we want all the systems to work and be better with the ultimate intent of improving student learning. So that's where this group, again, these are developed at the school site. These are developed in a relationship with all the teacher leaders and the administrators at each site. So depending upon the site, you could have a dozen or more individuals involved in identifying and establishing the success plan. So teacher voice is in here throughout the entire process. This actually is revisited multiple times throughout the year. So at the, the May roughly is when this team, these are last year's 21-22, they looked at results, they identified where they're at, they identified their successes, opportunities and next steps, aspirations they have for the following year and the results they're looking for. So that's a piece that the team did in May. They'll come back in this very room here in just a few weeks as the, what are we up to, about 90 individuals or something like that, Kevin? Faculty members will come in and spend time recommitting, re-familiarizing re, uh, themselves with this work, and then they continue back into the schools. Jeff, you have something there? Well, I partly answered what I was just going to ask was the time frame of them, like in the, in the building levels, sorry, when, sorry, when are sorry, they sorry. working on these goals? Yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I think you had partially answered it right before I right. asked it, but it was about the time frame of when these are worked on from uh, the different components in the district, whether it's the ad administration, um, at the building level, and uh, I mean, I'm presuming it's not all year round that there's maybe a, a, a chunk out of the year where this is a bigger focus for the building before yeah, so depending upon who's there, the reflective piece, again, there was in May with that teacher leadership team of the administration, then there's checkpoints throughout the year as they're looking at how we're we making progress towards our process goals. Then the key part that comes in here next is driving that to that next level. So these are driven down to the team level. This is an example of a third grade team SMART goal for last year. You see across the top, location, the, the team that was on there, the committee, the teacher leader that was involved, the team leaders, and you will also notice the driving piece from the very beginning we talked about is the overarching district goal of ensuring that students find successes in 21st century knowledge skills. Intellectual growth and development of all learners. That's the driving district goal here. Not that the others aren't connected, but that's a driving district goal. Then the school goal, they're then knocking it down, saying, look, we're looking at increased percentage of students performing at or above proficiency, in this example is reading on the STAR assessment. So looking at that. Then what you can see, then the team here, they went over and they drilled that down to the next uh, kind of closest area in here, and some of this goal development. Here's our current reality. Here's where we sit today, in third grade. 69% of our students third grade started the school year at or above proficiency. Their goal is to get that number to 80%. So there's your intent, there's your current reality, your desired state, and then more, there's the specific strategies, action steps, not from board, <laughs> not from me, not from the administration of the building, it's the collective energy of this third grade team saying this is where we are, this is what we know, this is what our ch the kids sitting in front of us today need, and this is what we're gonna do to help get after them. So things like Fontes and Pinnell, reading sources, tier one support. So drive that back to a fiduciary responsibility from the board, you'll look at, oh, well, are we supporting that from a board perspective and our fiduciary, yes, those are new learning resources and things like that. So you can see how those come along in the way. And then ultimately, 
then as they reflect at the end of the year, then it's like, okay, so what are the results? So the close of the school year, 85% of the kids, third grade students were at or above proficiency. In addition, the students that received AIS services, academic intervention support, moved from 37% proficiency in the fall to 77% proficiency on the STAR reading. So that's the specific measurable impact, not at this level, it's at that level with those three kids in those eight sections. And that's the piece. And then they reflect, so what next? So we talked about continuous permit four, so where do we go next? So then they start the process again. So they're looking at the third grade students, the success, the third grade was the strongest grade level over there this year in that success piece. So they looked at that and had the conversation that specifically those teachers are gonna get a refresh around our foundations program, which is uh, uh, early reader uh, access for our program, started at Primos. And then also the, the idea about science of reading, best practice and literacy, that's gonna go ahead and connect across all grade levels. So it didn't, the, uh, the practice and best thoughts didn't just stay in third grade, because it's a connected three through five leadership team, they brought their information back, they said, hey, what are you, what are you doing, what's going on? What you? And so now their determination from process next year is to go ahead and make sure the Fontsville Mini Lessons curriculum will continue to provide guided reading, results-based, they'll be working on their new updated results goal with the children that are in front of them that year. So if you think about, again, where we're starting and where we're going, that's how excellence in action gets moving forward. So I'm gonna give you two minutes to go back so you had what your understanding was then, what is it now? So I'll give you two minutes, just turn it back and continue that conversation. So what is your understanding of goal setting in the district now? Yeah. All right, we're gonna go ahead and see if we can pull back together here. We'll those kind of things gotta be. So the rest of our time here now is to kind of go through some examples and things like that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm going to hand it off to Jamie because the, the kind of the next question I think okay. goes from there and then you I'll just kind of hang off on the side because there's any clarifying questions for me for a second. In. Absolutely and you know I appreciate you know Dr. Planch going through the process and one of the things I want to point out front here is there's no one tried and true methodology to create district goals. There's different avenues in which you can take. My you know me coming in today is to discuss about best practices and processes that may fit for you, but ultimately it's incumbent upon you to determine what's gonna work best for the district. As you know, Dr. Blanche has pointed out, a lot of work had been put into the development of this success plan, and there's sort of been a process, but we wanna talk about future processes. And so what I'd like to hear from you right now before we go into the next two questions is a little bit about the success plan and the development in terms of what is your understanding, that last question that Dr. Blanche had given you about the process, and if you could just kind of, whomever took notes, just kind of report out uh, about the general conversation that took place at your table. So, you know, if you guys wouldn't mind, we'll start at this table and just kind of go around in terms of, you know, what was the discussion around your understanding of how the plan is developed? Um, yeah, and I guess we first, we talked more about, um, we had talked more about our understanding of how the goals were developed, mm -hmm. um, which from that perspective, we had kind of talked about how they seem to be developed kind of collaboratively with the administration and the um, leaders, the administrative leaders and team leaders and teacher instructional staff within each school building at that point. And then um, in terms of the goal development, the board's involvement, it tends to be that the goals are presented to the board. Mm -hmm. The board hasn't been part of that development process. Um, and that and the success plan kind of similarly with a lot of input from community and teachers and instructional staff within the school. Did you want to add anything, Ife? Yeah, I, I think the, the board uh, is one element uh, should be involved in the goal setting. That's no question. Mm -hmm. The question, of course, is what level, what detail, what you know, specifics uh, to get involved. And the board is representing the community in a way, supposedly, okay, uh, definitely more impartial in the sense that is representing the, the community. So in that aspect, the board should be involved at the level, any issues that the community is concerned, okay, uh, which is the school and the, the faculty and the so on, uh, may or may not uh, aware of or may or may not take the same opinion or same position and so on, that board serves the role to be a, um, Call it arbitrator, call it understanding, call it you know resolver of issues, so on. So that process of goal setting 
uh, should get more involved. And when we have a excellent, you know, notion, philosophy driving our school, the next level, you know, as we talk, talked about in previous sessions, how do we set those goals, really bring things year after year with clear achievement, clear objective, you know, that is, is uh, uh, obtained. And that part, again, the board should get involved so we can, you know, relate that. This conceptual whole child process is excellent, but we have to look at what did we do last year, the year before, so on. I do know that the school has uh, your internal process of a, of a sort of comparison, but that may not be transparent to the board and the community in a more, uh, call it data-driven, call it uh, more you know, uh, openly uh, uh, discussed the fashion, uh, towards positive objectives, okay? I think that's very important because I think this community, uh, when, whenever they have misunderstanding or have a different opinion, usually is because they did not see that, you know, data, transparency, you know, it presented to everybody. So we formed, you know, consensus. That's why we have, you know, opinions coming in. It's just example we were talking about, let's say teaching math, what kind of math, what kind of process, you know, how we do it, why we have different opinions. We should resolve that, and board has a role in that process. Okay. Okay, excellent. And, and if I understood you correctly, a lot of the conversation you had was just how the goals are sort of developed into the objectives and created an actionable plan internally. And what I understand, that process involves a lot of teacher collaboration in order to create those and to create the measurables to determine are we moving in the right direction. And obviously then at the end of the year, you, you, you're assessing that. But if I understood you correctly, we kind of delved into these two questions, which is great, because I think instead of doing a small group, we can do this as a whole group. If I understood you correctly, one of the things that was missing from the process was the board's involvement. And correct me if I'm wrong, that the goals that were developed were presented to the board as opposed to the board having an active role in the process. Is that accurate? Yeah. So the other thing that I heard you say was kind of that transparency piece as representatives of the community. How do we create that transparency when it comes to the plan at large? And we can talk a little bit about how you can actualize that within the normal operations of the school board and how that information should be funneled upwards to you periodically uh, at board meetings. So you are creating not only the ability to monitor those goals throughout the year, just not at the end of the year, but throughout the duration of the year and creating that transparency. And, and I will address that. So thank you. Uh, let's go to the next group. So sort of your understanding and if you'd like to talk a little bit about what you liked about the process and what you feel was missing, anything that we haven't uh, you know, articulated as well. Sure. Uh, so we did talk um, timeline, right? As it, Claire was, uh, gave us a good, uh, and Claire feel free to hop in if I butcher the timeline. But we were trying to figure out the, the overall you know, process and to where we actually see it, right? Yeah. And um, the, the the cabinet, you know, uh, Ray and his team do you know work on this plan here, then take that, uh, and this gets worked on uh, April, or, or uh, late summer, early summer, sorry, April, yeah. April June, yeah. and then it gets passed to the the, the buildings, you know, the you know, buildings heads or leads, mm -hmm. right, uh, principals, you know, early summer they'll take a look at that and, and then start passing that, you know, have some I guess time to comment back on this, um, and then start passing that down to their you know, their staff within the schools come up with a goal and then we see the grade level goal stuff like this. Now, and Ray, Nancy, you just you know, correct me if I'm wrong, right, but my, I'm trying to go off of memory from last year, mm -hmm. the down to the details of the specific grade or school level, I feel like we didn't get to see that. That got bubbled up to us maybe in the fall, am I accurate? It's in October, correct, the whole time. It's in October, report. right, so this is happening in you know starting in april june you know june through the summer mm -hmm. hopefully it gets finalized before the school you know starts but again come october we're finally seeing the the output of that well if you if you remember in the last dashboard in june all that information was put up there as well too that uh, you would see in the october report for the it was uh, third through eighth grade it was it was in there and stuff like that yeah so it, it was presented there yep. not in the board meeting though in our it was in that dashboard because it's, it's kind of after school's closed uh, when yeah. we get those results, pretty much. Good. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, for the for the numbers for yep, last yep, year. Yep. Yeah, yeah, but not the goals for the the uh, each you know, whether the grade or the the schools. School not this plan. for the schools. Yeah, that plan. success plan is uh, when the principals come to that fall meeting. The fall meeting is the first that. time yes. we see it. So yes. th th that was just kind of it's it. Yeah. It feels kind of what's missing in the process there. It just feels like we're getting that late in the game, and it's already established in the, in the you know in the year. Sure. Um, again, as a representative of the the school district, right, and and getting asked questions, you know, and I, I'm going to go from now until the fall, right. So my personal you know perception on it is, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm not sure exactly what the individual school goals are until the yeah. fall piece of it, right. So again, being I don't want to be part of the process as far as the teachers go in that level. I don't want to pick any of that stuff there, but you know, just being more involved in understanding what's coming up and you know, what's being done before we go into kids coming into the classroom and knowing that there's something there, um, I think is kind of something I would like to see or that's missing for me. Um, did you have anything to add? Yeah, can I? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally the mic. Um, yeah all, all of that uh, definitely I mean that, that's what a lot of, a lot of our discussion was here I, I think as, as as a board as as, um, as a team here board working with the administration what we're what, what, I, what I hear from a lot of us and and what I think myself too when we go through this is we're, we're just really striving for some more clarity on the granularity of the board's um input in the goals mm -hmm. you know because because we, we don't want to be involved in the third grade team <laughs> setting you know how they're going to achieve their yeah. improvements so wh where is that where is that level that sweet spot yep. where we have the greatest impact and and is reachable for us also um that you know some sometimes we can have I, I feel like you know maybe I, I want to be more involved, but that might be overreaching what I can actually accomplish. So I'm, I'm trying to, as, as a board member, and, and I think all of us as a team, that we're, that's something we're really trying to figure out. Yeah, absolutely, and that's one of the things we're going to delve into. You know, what is the responsibility of the board? How does the board have input? But more importantly, how do they work in tandem with the internal staff and not fall into that you know that pitfall of micromanagement and getting into the weeds? obviously you want to stay within your domain so we can kind of go down that avenue i'm glad you brought up timeline because there are different timelines you may want to consider but i think what i hear from you in terms of not only the transparency component but also the timeline piece is really having it mapped out throughout the year so now when people do approach you where are you in this process when are the goals being developed you can be be able to articulate that better so i think you know part of the planning process is to carve out that timeline so now it becomes very apparent and there are different options in terms of when you can develop the goals and to kind of jump the gun here a little bit there are districts who will revisit their broad visionary district goals they generally do that in about october now the planning is not for that academic year but what they're doing is they're starting to plan for the following academic year the benefit behind that is it creates a much longer runway for now those building teams to work to create those objectives and to create the action plan so by the time you're entering into the school year in September all those plans are already created and what you're going to do is a lot of boards come together in about August and they kind of just go through the plan all right here's our goals here's the action plan here's how we're going to monitor those as we go throughout the year and that becomes a little bit more of a fluid process but again th th there's no one size fits all it really depends upon what you're doing and what you want to accomplish the other piece too that i'll kind of get into here is that when you create those broad goals like you see in that success plan those tend to have a shelf life meaning they're generally not going to change anywhere from about three to five years. Doesn't mean you can't revisit them and make updates as necessary, but what you have is more in line with what a strategic plan looks like. Within a strategic plan, it's the objectives. Yeah. They're gonna change on an annual basis, and part of the board's responsibility is being privy to how are we working towards those objectives? Have we hit our benchmarks? Were there anything that came out of left field like COVID that hit us that we weren't anticipating that has derailed our efforts? And that becomes part of the, the monitoring process, and, and we'll dive a little bit uh, further into that. So I'd like to hear from the last group if they have more to add, and, and from their perspective. Yes, sir. Um, so the first question was how the success plan was developed and we talked a bit about how we'd like to see it developed and we agreed with other groups that 
it felt oftentimes that the overarching goals for the district were mm -hmm. sort of presented to the board and not uh, uh, a part of the process that we did together. Now, I, I just have to acknowledge that last year we did spend quite a bit of time building our goals together. Yeah. Um, I think we spent also a lot of time talking about uh, what we liked about the development, but also what was missing, we thought, and what we would like included, if it's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so check me if I have this right. I took notes. <laughs> um, you're shocked. Uh, so, and Nick, you had said about the success planning in the fall meeting being sort of like a little bit too late, even though it's previewing for next year, but I also think it's important to sort of revisit. So if we were talking about what we thought would be missing from the process is, again, having that understanding up front and something else that we that we talked about is the the clarity of the goals and we were mm -hmm. we took a peek maybe we stepped ahead but we looked at the sample district goals that you shared yeah. um, and it feels like our goals are more mission vision e and less goal e and so we were wondering you know if there was a possibility to be mm -hmm. a little bit more specific not so specific that to your point it doesn't address all of the schools um, but that there's a little bit more heft to them um, and that, and that again, we could be part of that process as the board in designing, developing, and then obviously walking away when the objectives are created um, to let the district and the schools do what they do yeah. best. Um, but we talked about, um, uh, you know, transparency. Yes, because transparency, transparency builds trust. That calibration with the board also increases our understanding and allows us to then communicate with the community, which mm -hmm. we, you had spoken about, Amanda, of like how do we communicate this back to the community, and we need to understand to be able to communicate it, um, and that we want to make sure that we're engaging in our shared governance and oversight, but not micromanaging. And so that was like, piece. and I like how you said, Chad, about um, reach. I didn't hear, I've never heard that before. I like that term because it's nicer, I think, than micromanaging, but you're right. Like, what's reachable to us? So I'd like to think about that, please, and thank you. I'm gonna stop talking. <laughs> And, and so that's really excellent input. And I think we got a lot about, you know, what was sort of missing from that process. And I can give you some guidance. Um, I'm sorry, did you, did you have something to add? No, I think everyone, like, covered everything. I don't want to, you know, I'm last. So it's... <laughs> no, 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 no. I didn't... I, 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 I kind of jumped the gun. I didn't realize it. By all means, please share your thoughts. No, I mean, I think we, we, we were talking about how, I mean, I, it kind of reiterates, that, you know, if it's like a 10-step process, we kind of end up at, like, eight or nine. And then it's... It's already set in stone before, um, so I agree with everyone on that. I, th I think that's important, and you know, just getting when things are presented, if it's already kind of a done deal, then you don't really feel like you have a, a role in the process. Or, mm -hmm. or I hate the word stakeholders, but you don't feel like you're a part of the process. Sure, absolutely. And so, you know, really quickly, just kind of throwing it out there, and I think I already heard a lot of it, but I just want to give you an opportunity to vocalize this one more time. So, what you know, what was in the process that you really liked? What do you feel was extreme value within that process that you know needs to be retained moving forward? What are your thoughts? You know, what did you like about the process? I, I think the involvement in across the whole district, all the professionals. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot of input, a lot of um, just personal investment. I think from experiences in that. I, mean, I, I think that's fantastic. Absolutely, and I commend you for that. Relationship people. Relationship, yes, right. Relationship people, again, you're inflating some egos it's here. It's important. <laughs> I'm just teasing. But I think, you know, I commend you because, you know, goals should not be created in a vacuum. Obviously, you want to solicit input, and based upon my understanding of how the plan was developed, there was a lot of outreach, not only internally to the staff, but reaching out to your community in order to get that input. And that I think that based upon the conversation here, that is something that you would like to retain. But in that process, better understanding of how do we as the board fit within that process and how do we better have sort of involvement in creating that transparency within that process at large. Go right ahead. Yeah, I, I think I would say just to that also, I, I think when you have that kind of outreach and involvement, it makes it hard for us to um, articulate where we are. I mean, it'd yeah. be a lot easier if we said, oh, well, we set these goals and then Dr. Blanche takes them and he just passes them on. But because there's so much involvement, it is a tough thing to articulate. And, and so I think as we clarify timelines and everything else we're talking about, I, I think that's really going to help. Yeah. Us. And I mean, you know, community involvement, not only external and internal, meaning your staff, you know, there's different avenues you can take. Tried and true strategic planning methods, you would have a series of workshops 
in which you would bring your stakeholders in that represent you know the various groups within your community the problem with that is that you got a way out and I shouldn't say it's a problem per se but it, you know here is uh, something you should be aware of is that that's very time consuming and that creates you know a longer runway you know we have the ability today to do electronic surveying and a lot of people are very used and you know, accustomed to that and so you know when going out with a survey maybe you consider that you know as I said you know you need to plan in order to plan my job is to give you guys food for thought today about how do we create that plan and best move forward so now everybody's on the same page we like the process and the thing about process wise is that it's not set in stone obviously you can revisit it year after year and you have this conversation what worked really well for us within this plan and development what did we find with some sort of you know struggles or hurdles and how can we improve the plan moving forward and so it, it's evolutionary it's ever changing it just never needs to be sort of this stagnant you know process at large so I'd like to yes go right ahead sir I'd like to ask you a question uh, yeah fire away uh, be, before the question, I also want to clarify why I asked the question. Yeah. Uh, we, we are a public school, and mm -hmm. there's only a difference between public school and private school. Um, the question is that, you know, uh, do you know or understand how private school will set their goals and mission, vision uh, differently from public school? And the reason I ask this question is that uh, we have so many public schools, the United States, right? Yeah. And, we don't really want every school exactly from the same cookie cutter, right? There is some personality with every school, mm -hmm. and that's really defined by the community. If we don't have community, we, we don't have a school, right? Yeah. So with that said, uh, I think the public school should take that personality issue into you know consideration as setting goals and missions and that's why i asked the question you know do you understand with the private school and public school how they set these things oh, yeah. you know differently in a different mentality or process and so on so you know just for clarity i'll be honest with you you know whether it be you know higher ed college level or private schools even charter schools process is process mm -hmm. it's the ingredients that creates the originality and so when you talk about sort of the district at large and the community at large and capturing sort of the uniqueness, that's the ingredients that goes into the process that creates the unique product. And so when you look at process, generally charter schools, public schools, private schools, higher ed, they use, you know, very similar processes and they get together to decide how are we going to plan this out and what works best for us. And again, my job here today is just to give you guys food for thought. So when you go into that planning and how do we best incorporate the board in all of this and how do we capture that uniqueness and the needs of our district and the positive aspects of what we're trying to accomplish, how does that get articulated in the goals? And a lot of what you're doing currently, you know, I think fits the bill. It just requires a little bit of tweaking as I said, you know, looking forward, you know, what is working well for us and then, you know, what do we want to do different in the future? And part of that's what I would like to explore, you know, just for a little bit right now. And I want to give you guys a little bit of a hands-on experience, but I want to give you guys food for thought. And where I like to start this conversation off, and this thing's a piece of junk, by the way, so I got to go this route, is that, you know, when it comes to school improvement planning, creating something like, you know, the success plan that you have, is that really when you look at the responsibility of the board, what is your job in terms of governance? Your job is to steer the ship. You need to understand the direction in which you're heading, right? Part of that comes through the establishment of that vision so you have an idea of where you want to go, but more importantly, how are you going to get there? And that's part of the board's responsibility in steering that ship. And in doing so, you want to ensure that you are getting input from your various stakeholders, not only internal and external, and that can be done through surveying. And the process that created the success plan, you brought in a lot of people's voices that got distilled down into that very nice success plan. Moving forward, that's what you want to consider. How do we continue to do that? Because what I heard from you, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that that was an important component. It helps create the transparency, but more importantly, it creates ownership. When people feel like they've had a voice in the process, they're more likely to support it. Not only are they more likely to support it, but you're more likely going to see the results in which you desire. And so part of that is that, you know, moving forward, how do we best do that? Now, the thing that I like to point out here is that looking at the school board, you guys operate at what's called the 30,000 foot view. I've heard it called the 20,000, 10,000, it doesn't matter, it's all the same. 
when we say you operate at the 30,000 foot view, what is your view? Your picture is on what? The entire it's district. on the entire district. You're looking at the big picture. Through the goal setting process, in terms of the board's involvement, you want to ensure that you're operating it, you stay at the 30,000 foot view because there are very well intended board members who descend and before you know it, you get caught into the weeds. The way that I like to discern this, the board's responsibility is to define the what. What is the district attempting to accomplish? That gets articulated in the, in the goal statement. It's broad, it's visionary, but there's substance behind it that defines the work that needs to get done. You then hand it off to the superintendent who figures out how to get that done. And the process that you have currently that's working at the building levels to develop those smart objectives and the actionable plan. And that's really where those two domains operate. But they work in tandem, right? Now, it's important to point out here that there are different types of goals, and I'm not going to really define those. There's board goals that are specific to you, there's district goals, the district at large, and then there's superintendent goals. Those goals tend to get extracted from your district goals. But what I want to talk about really quickly is just to define the difference between a goal and an objective. And I think it's important just to spend a couple minutes because too often we use these synonymously. There is a difference, especially when we're talking about a process like we are today. And I use a very simple you know, explanation here, and I think at some time or another, we've all decided, you know what, I need to lose weight. So say, for example, that I decide that I need to lose 50 pounds. How can I achieve my goal? Well, there's different avenues, right? I can diet, I can exercise, but we all know diet and exercise programs don't work the same for everybody. So I would go out and I would seek professional advice, maybe see a dietitian, work with a personal trainer, maybe see my doctor. I'm gonna take all of that and put it into some type of plan of action in order for me to lose, my, to, to lose my weight. So how do I know if I'm making progress? Well, it's quite simple. I'm gonna use quantitative and qualitative data. I can step on a scale that can determine whether or not I'm working in the right direction. People can tell me you're looking better. My clothes are looser. So I'm gonna use data to help monitor my progress. Bada bing, check me out. I'm ready for the beach. But here's my question <laughs> to you, all right? I set a goal to lose 50 pounds. Was that really my goal or was I working towards something much larger? And if so, what is it? What was I really working towards? What are your thoughts? There you go. I wanted to lose weight, but to create and maintain a healthy lifestyle. That's my goal. So what then is losing 50 pounds? What does that become? That's actually a what? Objective. That's an objective. When you look at in terms of applying this scenario to a school district, right? The board works with the superintendent. Through a process, you create the large goals for the district. That's done by soliciting input from your community and then using that input to determine what are our priorities and then what is it that we are trying to accomplish. From there, it gets handed off to the superintendent. There are boards and a workshop that will be part of it, but really this is something that is driven by the superintendent and administrators in which to create the, uh, the SMART goals. You currently have the practice and I think this is a great practice, and that's my opinion, because I've seen it work in a lot of other districts where you have the building level teams create that plan of action and then gets reported to the board. And so it becomes this strategy, and then you have your action plan, and as Dr. Blanche pointed out, that's what you currently have. So when you look at goals versus objectives, they work in tandem to produce results. Goals is really that vision of what you're trying to accomplish. The objectives becomes the how. And again, as I pointed out, the board's domain is the goals, the superintendent's domain is the objectives. And we gotta work within those respective fields. Now that does not mean that the board cannot have input into those SMART goals. And through the process of developing the goals, you define what you deem to be the critical work that needs to be invested within the school district. That's also, and I'll explain how that works. Question? Go, uh, goals, so goal setting. You uh, differentiate those from mission and vision too, right? So, mission so and vision yeah, typically your mission very rarely ever changes. Yeah. Sometimes through a strategic planning initiative, you decide we want to revisit it. But you know, your mission is why you exist. Vision does have a shelf life. It tends to be no more than 10 years, and in my opinion, 10 years is too long. Through a process, you can decide we need to visit our vision. 
The vision is the collectiveness. But the goals themselves, and I'll explain this in a little bit more uh, uh, different, and they are very similar to what you have, they're vision, visionary in nature. If we were to accomplish everything we wanted to within this area, what would that look like? That's your job as the board, to define what it is you're trying to accomplish. How it gets done, again, that falls into the superintendent's domain, so you're working in that collaborative fashion and it's supporting one another. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I just want to make sure there's a Absolutely. difference. Absolutely. So really what we want to do in this process is really kind of cross the bridge between where we are net right now, where do we want to be in the future, how do we get there, and in that process, how do we best monitor that action? Really what we're trying to do is to not you know, try to make random acts of improvement, but to streamline our resources, right? We don't have unlimited resources, we have very limited. Therefore, we need to determine where are the, the areas that we would like to see growth, and then how do we direct those resources and efforts so we streamline that process. So in the, and through that, we're not only fulfilling our mission, but we're working towards our collective vision, and as I indicated along the way, we're making sure that we're moving in the right direction. One of the things that you need to do in terms of improvement planning, you gotta determine where is our point of access. Now, looking at here, these are the, the main components of an improvement plan. Again, you have your mission, why we exist, vision, what do we hope to be in the future, we have our district goals, we have our SMART goals, we have an action plan, and then we have a feedback loop in which we're ensuring that reporting is coming back to the board and we're monitoring that process. When we look at this, you already have a mission and you already have a vision. Where the access point is, is really kind of revisiting your district goals. Because correct me if I'm wrong, you're at that point right now where the board really didn't have a voice. There might be other areas that are not included in the current plan, and so we need to revisit those district goals. Once those are carved out, the next step then becomes the SMART goals, which then leads to the action plan, which then leads to the reporting. But generally, when you assess this, you want to determine what is it we're trying to accomplish. And maybe, maybe five years down the road, you might decide we need to revisit our mission, and that sort of changes your approach and what you try to do. Can I ask a quick question? Sure, fire away. So, is it my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, our yep. mission and vision, I think, have been, were established at least 10 years ago? Is that correct, or have they been updated since then? Uh, no, the 10, 10 years ago with you know, subtle adjustments along the way, and the most recent would be last summer mm -hmm. when we spent some time and got some feedback from you know, so the board. We did board. make some changes to subtle, it. Subtle, subtle language changes, okay. really as much of a reconfirmation to it. The buckets, the three buckets were still resonating with folks and things like that too, so. Okay, that, just checking on that. Yeah. You got me nervous, I, 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 you said 10 years, I'm like, wait a minute, I thought they just revisited them, so I'm glad yeah, to so hear that that was yeah, the minor, case. Yeah, minor changes, <laughs> not like a start from scratch. Right. And that's typically what happens, and I've led those workshops, mm -hmm. you know, where we come in and we look at our mission, is it still viable, does it still state why we exist, sometimes we make some language changes, the vision might be, you know, sometimes we scrap it entirely, but other times it just takes some updating, mm -hmm. um, and, and it sounds like you guys have already done that. But when you look at the steps, and this just kind of outlines them in terms of what you need to do in creating a, you know, an actionable plan, in your case, your success plan. Obviously, there's the planning phase that comes in. You then would go out with a stakeholder survey. Either that or you would conduct workshops because it's important to elicit that information both externally and internally. The next step, if you were to choose to do this, but you guys have already done this, is to take a look at your mission and vision. This does not have to happen every year. You then look at data because data is gonna help inform you in terms of how are we performing as a district. Question. Just quick question, Jamie. We're talking overall here as the board. So what you're de outlining here- are I'm outlining all the steps. Of, well, I just wanna be clear. The steps that you're sharing are the steps that this board and the trustees are supposed to be enacting, correct? So this is part of the planning to plan. Correct. So this is something that, you know, as I said, you need to identify what is our access point. And again, you know, based upon the work that's already been done, you're, you're sort of accessing at the district goal level because you want to revisit those, determine, you know, are they still viable, are there areas that we missed, maybe make tweaks to the current ones. I'm just trying to clarify yep. that it's the role of the trustees on the board because I think that there's a little role confusion sometimes as trustees, so, so yes. that's helpful. This is something that you would work in collaboration. I don't recommend that this be solely taken upon by the board, and I haven't gotten to the point yet, but I'll jump the gun. Amazing. What you may want to consider doing is to create a planning committee. 
on a planning committee, you can determine who's on the planning committee because they're going to plan, obviously, to do the next plan. That planning committee would determine the timeline of how are we going out with the survey, when are we going to create a time for us to get together to review data, you know, the steps that are involved. A lot of times the planning committee, I don't recommend more than 14, and I think you might, me personally, 14 is a very high number. You don't want too many cooks in the kitchen, but that would be an opportunity for board members, administrators, teachers, and community members, and even if you wanted to bring students on there, because it's a great opportunity for them to incorporate that planning committee. They would be the ones to sort of take this and develop sort of at large a little bit of a timeline and work on that planning phase. These are just all the steps that are involved if that makes sense. And I'll kind of get a little bit more into where does the board operate within all of this. Is yeah, that a uh, just some clarity on that, because then I'm yeah. confused by the previous discussion, which is there, the 30,000 foot view. And if what Lindsay was asking is this, the, are you outlining the steps of the board here? And then I get confused with seven, eight, um, those seem like. Yeah, no, these are just all the steps that are involved. Plan, implement, like, the, you know, just clarity on that. Yeah, these right. are just all the steps that are involved in school improvement planning. We're going to take right. the next step yeah. in a minute here to get down a little bit more into roles. Not the board's like role, necessarily. Like yes. Yes. Correct, yes. And, and I'll explain that as we kind of wade through this. But those were great questions because I could see, you know, the, a little bit of uh, confusion around that. So, as I said, you know, first thing you want to do, and this is sort of a board level conversation that you have with your superintendent. How are we going to plan to plan? What is our parameters in doing so? Are we going to create a planning committee? If that makes sense, then yes. If not, is this the work that the board is going to undertake to create sort of the action steps through the planning? And again, you would work in collaboration with your superintendent. You want to determine, are we going to do a stakeholder dive? And again, this is some, I'm sorry, stakeholder survey, and this is a board level conversation, all right? Do you work collaboratively with your superintendent? Do we want to go out? If so, that then becomes an internal job. You define the what. What do we need? A stakeholder survey. How are we going to do that? That's your superintendent. So that's where the two domains operate, but that's how you work together in a tandem line. And again, the timeline, you know, what's realistic for us in developing all of this and if you, plan, if, you, uh, if you designate it to a committee, they're going to designate the timeline. If it's the board and superintendent, then you work collaboratively in order to do that. And there are boards who just hand it off to the superintendent and say, you come back to us with a plan. Because that's part of what the superintendent would do is then work with the administrative cabinet. So there's different avenues that you can consider. Committee, board works with superintendent. Board works with superintendent administrators to create a plan, or board delegates to superintendent administrators to develop sort of the plan and bring it back to the board. So those are different avenues that you guys could consider and what would work best for you. But ultimately, the board will have a role in the development of the goal process. So as I said, you want to consider committee. I've already gone through this. No more than 14 is realistic, and I, I think 14 is too much. But you definitely want to have it a mixture of different stakeholder groups. What I've seen some boards do is they're going to invite business owners within the community into the mix because I think getting their input is also very important. It's great if you have business owners that actually live in the district that you may want to reach out to because then you get you know, more bang for your quote unquote buck. <laughs> who have you seen, uh, who runs the planning committee? So the planning committee you would designate just as an ad hoc committee. This would be board created. You would do it through resolution at your board meeting, but beforehand, just like any committee, you would identify the composition, meeting frequency, and what is the charge. You would then designate you know, a chair to the committee that would help coordinate and run, and all of that would get reported back. So you run it very similar to however, except it's an ad hoc committee, meaning that it just serves its purpose, and once it's done, it dies. Got it. But so it's typically would it would a chair typically be a, an administrator or a board member? How does the that board can decide, board decide who would be the best to chair it. Some prefer that the superintendent chair it or an administrator. Some prefer a board member. Mm -hmm. Really, you want to decide who would be the best person to fill that, mm -hmm. and that's how you would determine the chair. Okay. So once you have, if you go down the planning, again, I'm going sort of step by step, and through the process, I define who does what through this. So you got your plan to plan, and again, I gave you different ways in which you can do that. Say, for example, you did hand it off to a committee, all right? The committee then would decide, are we going to go out with a stakeholder survey? Sometimes the stakeholder survey gets delegated to the superintendent administrators to develop. Other times it goes through the committee, but ultimately it's going to go out through the district. When you're going out with a stakeholder survey, 
Again, I already pointed this out. You have internal and you have external stakeholders. You want to ensure that everybody has the ability to do it. Generally, what a lot of districts do today um, is they go through electronic survey. You guys, uh, do you guys have thought exchange by any, do you guys have that? It's expensive. Yeah, no, not right now. No. <laughs> <laughs> but there are free ones like Google Docs. I've worked with Google Docs yeah. before. It's a wonderful platform and there's other ways that you could go out. And I think you guys did yours, what, SurveyMonkey? Correct. Survey you guys, and you could even use SurveyMonkey if you want to, right? But when you go out with a stakeholder survey, you need to determine what is it that we're asking our community for. That goes back to understanding what elements of the plan are we developing. If, and I use this as the example, and this is not something I believe you guys are going to do, but if you were going to revisit your mission and vision and develop district goals, you want to ensure that you have questions that are aligned to elicit the responses that will then be used to help you to create that plan. So I just gave you a sort of a smattering of what I stole off of other surveys that I've seen districts go out with. I have a list of other questions. If you are interested, I'm more than happy to supply those to you. So you would do your stakeholder survey when you do the stakeholder survey, I always ask boards to keep in mind, or the planning committee to keep in mind, that you want to keep it short and succinct. If you've ever filled out a survey, I know for me personally, if I know that there's more than you know, 15 questions, I don't want to do it. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it turns me off. Make sure you have the appropriate number of questions to allow people to want to take it, not only want to take it, but will actually take it so that's just some things you want to take into consideration. The other thing too is that you want to have clear messaging. If you're going out with a community survey, an email to people sometimes isn't the best way to do it. What I encourage districts to do is to tap into their community networks. Find out where your social hubs are. All right, if there are churches within your community, for example, contact them and have them make the announcement to their you know, parishioners that we're looking for people to fill out this survey. You know, go to you know, other community centers, you know, retirement centers if you had it. Try to get the, work, uh, the word out. The other thing too is that you may want to take extra steps to get those underrepresented people within your community. Those folks, you tend to never hear their voice maybe figure out a way to reach out to them. And sometimes all it takes is just really a personal message to them. It can be a little bit time consuming. It's up to you whether or not that's the appropriate route to go. Generally, when the surveys are open, they tend to stay open for about two weeks. You don't want to linger out there much longer than that. But you want to do the prep work up front to make sure you get the messaging out there, you get the survey out there because you want people to fill it out. Not only do you want people to fill it out, you want to get as many people to fill it out as you possibly can. So mission and vision, I'm going to skip over. The data dive would come next. I don't really prefer the word data dive at the board level. Really data dives happen internally. That's what your administrators do, that's what your teachers do. I like the phrase data tread mm -hmm. at the board level. What I mean by a data tread is you're understanding sort of the district as a whole. How are we performing? How are our subgroups performing? Are there areas that presents opportunities that we can improve upon? If so, through the data, what might they be? Now, with data, there's a lot of things that you can do. I'm not gonna read you know, all of this because I don't want to insult your intelligence, but you know, what can data do for you? It can really help you understand the district at large. Really, there's four main types of data that you're gonna take a look at. Number one is achievement data. Number two is your demographics. Number three, your programs that you have as well as your processes, but also perceptional data. And through a survey that you give, a lot of times you get perceptional data. Now, the caveat, to perceptional data, and I say this very facetiously, okay, and I don't want to offend anybody, but you know, you got to be cautious of what are dubbed the CAVE people. Are you familiar with the CAVE acronym? Mm -hmm. Stands for Citizens Against Virtually Everything. Yeah. Doesn't matter what you do, you did it wrong. That decision you made, it was terrible. All right, the thing about CAVE people is that they tend to be the smallest uh, segment of your population, but they have the loudest voice. Now, yes, it's sort of a negative to call them quote unquote cave people, but sometimes the cave people do have a legitimate voice. 
And it's important at the board and administrative level that we listen to them to determine whether or not their input is very credible. But the thing about perceptional data, and I have seen this time and again, sometimes what happens is, and this happens at the board level, I was down at Smitty's Diner and I overheard some community members talking about this problem within the district. Next thing you know, it's a problem. Well, how do we know? All right. Perceptional data, what you want to do is if you're gathering data, you got to walk into it with a certain lens, okay? You can't jump to the conclusion that because somebody says it's a problem or a major concern, it actually is. As a board, you investigate through the appropriate avenues, which is designating your superintendent to look into those areas that you're seeing repetitively to determine whether or not there's validity behind it. So that's just the cautionary tale of using perceptional data. As I said, use qualitative and quantitative. That's the data component, but also using people's thoughts and feelings about the district because that's extremely important. I'm gonna skip over this. This is, this is uh, just a little lesson about how we use data. But the whole point here is that using that survey, the qualitative and quantitative, you wanna create a visual picture of the district. You wanna understand where are we currently. Not only where are we currently, but what opportunities do we have to make improvements. And so the next step of the process is what then is going to fall within the board's domain. You plan to plan, you go out with a survey, you then look at some data, you then have a workshop which would be done in public and it's up to you who you want to bring into the workshop. Typically what I recommend at the bare minimum it's the board and it's going to be the superintendent and administrative cabinet and then you can determine what other key personnel are we going to bring in the room to create district goals? Now, a lot of times it's either we're gonna review the previous goals and use the information that we have in order to update and modify this plan and that tends to be that part of continuous improvement. Before you get in that workshop, you would have already gone over the community survey because it's a time saver. You don't wanna spend all day in a, in a workshop looking at community survey data. All right, you, you would have looked at data presented from the superintendent. Now the thing about the data piece too, some boards decide that we don't need this. We get presented data on a regular basis. We have a great understanding. That may not be a step that you need to invest time in, but, that's a, but that would be part of what you at the board and the committee would need to figure out. The other piece too that I recommend you do before this workshop, and I'm gonna thank you guys, and here's why in my conversations, I found that you guys use a SOAR analysis, strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and results. For years at the association, we've done a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Years ago when I explored these different, because they generally work towards the same, but they're devised a little bit differently. Before, I always preferred the SWAT, but you guys have now turned me on to this SOAR, <laughs> the appreciative inquiry. And the reason being is because I misunderstood what the SOAR can actually do. I always thought the SOAR didn't capture your quote unquote weaknesses. What I really like about the SOAR model is that it reframes it into a positive, meaning that what area are we not doing so great at that presents an opportunity for growth and change? And once I understood that, so thank you for that, it was great because that gives me a lot of food for thought. What I would recommend you do before you get into this is that you use the community survey, you use the data, and then you use the SOAR analysis. And I'll explain why you're going to do that, okay? So what the SOAR analysis is going to do is that you're gonna take your qualitative and you're gonna take your quantitative and it gets distilled into a manageable document because now you're gonna use this SOAR analysis in order to create your district goals. So I'll give you an example of how this gets done. And who would fill out the SOAR analysis? That would be for you to determine. Generally, again, it's the board, all right, it's going to be the administrators, it's going to be the superintendent, and it's gonna be other key personnel. Remember, you've already got your stakeholder input through a survey. You're then going to incorporate that into your SOAR analysis, and again, this becomes a manageable document. So here's an example of what a SOAR analysis could, um, could encapsulate. And before I do that, the other thing too that I just wanted to go back and just quickly point out here is that when you have people fill out the SOAR analysis, you need to have guiding questions. 
And part of what I did in examining this is I had to determine, okay, how do I frame each one of these categories to fit the world of education and to elicit the responses that will help us in the process? So strengths, what is it that we do really well that we build on? Opportunities, what are external challenges? Or things that the district can piggyback on that will help us? And I like this, what are our stakeholders asking from us? I think that's an important piece. Aspirations, what do we care deeply about? How do we make a positive impact on staff and students and their outcomes? What do we want to accomplish or become in the future? So again, this is a little bit more visionary. The results piece doesn't necessarily need to be the specific measurements, but it can be things of how do we know that we are succeeding? What's gonna guide us in that understanding? What outcomes will demonstrate we have achieved success? So for example, if we aspire to have you know, uh, enrichment courses, right? how do we know if we're moving in that direction? Well, we're gonna use enrollment. Are we getting kids that are signing up for it? And that could be something as simplistic as that. So really quickly here, here's just something that a SOAR analysis, and this is fictitious. Uh, I pulled this off of just ones that I found online from other districts. If there's any similarities to your district, it's just mere coincidence. All right, so strengths, you got teachers, updated tech, innovative teaching practices, restorative practices have been implemented. What are opportunities? Well, there's untapped wraparound services. We know mental health is a big issue that we're trying to tackle. Maybe there's some mental health facilities that can help us in that capacity. We have an influx of ELL students, right? We know we wanna work over in our opportunities to have this diverse learning community. That presents a great opportunity if we have an influx of people with diversity. That creates great opportunities. You know, we need to replenish our, our funds. What do we wanna become? You know, what are our aspirations? We want 100% graduation rate. All right, how do we know? And you can take a look here. So these are the types of things that a SOAR analysis attempts to capture. When you come together in a workshop, you are going to be primarily looking at the SOAR analysis. What I like to do when I facilitate these is I usually will have the superintendent review very quickly to refresh everybody's uh, minds what was captured on the community survey. You then would work in small groups and what you would do is you would review the SOAR analysis. What I tend to have them do is you would go through that analysis and you would highlight repetitive things, or, uh, you know, repetitive themes or issues that are crucial, that you feel within a success plan, we as a board, we as a district need to dedicate time, attention, and resources. This needs to be articulated. So you identify through that SOAR analysis what you believe are those priorities for the district. Once you have done that, and here is the caveat, is, I should back up here a second, as you're going through that SOAR analysis, you need to take a page from Patrick Lencioni that if we make everything important, then nothing becomes important. I usually give participants in a workshop a highlighter to highlight the SOAR analysis and I tell them, I don't want you to be like a seventh grader reading something with a highlighter because everything is highlighted, except for maybe two words. <laughs> Always made me laugh. What you then do is you then would identify, based upon the SOAR analysis, thematically, what are those areas that we could classify that information? What are our goal categories? Now, because you have an existing success plan, part of this process would be to look at those. Are they still appropriately labeled? And I think that there would be you know, apprehension to change that, or you could modify them, but I think that part of that would be, do we continue to carry these on? But more importantly, are there other categories that we missed? For example, you know, our fiscal stewardship. Is that an area that we missed that needs to be encapsulated in this plan? So I just gave you an example. If I looked at the SOAR analysis that I presented to you, you may decide, you know what, here are three categories that we could you know, generate. The way that I look at goal categories is like walking into a department store. How do I know where things are? It's easy because they're in departments, right? That's what you're doing in this process. You're just really shining a spotlight on a big area that you are then gonna focus the lens down in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. The next step of the process that I generally would lead the groups through is then you take the SOAR analysis and you would classify that information into the various 
goal categories. So now we're creating priorities. What is it that we want to sort of, you know, uh, capitalize upon? Where are those areas for growth and improvement? So you would categorize them out. This is the work that the board, again, does with administrators, if you so choose to. There are some boards who don't want administrators to be part of it, and again, that's part of the process that you would figure out. The next step would be then to articulate what is it that we're trying to achieve. This is how we get from all that information, classifying the priorities to create a goal category with a goal statement. And I just kind of threw one together. To graduate all students who are prepared to succeed in a diverse world by challenging and supporting each individual so they will reach their full potential. That becomes your goal statement. That is what you are trying to accomplish. When I've done workshops like this, people will say, well, Jamie, that, that's a great goal statement. And my first response is, of course it is, because I wrote it. <laughs> but then they want to challenge me. Jamie, that's great, but it's nothing but fluff. I wholeheartedly disagree. This is the worst analogy in the world, but it's the only one that I've ever come up with. And if you come up with one better, I'm going to steal it and say I came up with it. And I did come up with this one because it's so terrible. All right, a word, a word in the English language is only a word because it has a what? Don't tell me vowel. Mm -hmm. It has meaning. It has a definition. This has meaning. How does it have meaning? Because we've defined what needs to be done. We have attached to this all the work from the community survey, looking at data, taking that qualitative and quantitative, and we distilled it down into the SOAR analysis, and we've figured out what is it that we need to lend our time and attention now we have a statement of what we're trying to accomplish. This is the work of the board. This is where you operate. You create these goal statements and you identify the priorities. This then gets handed off. And again, this is the what. The next step of the planning process, and I'm not going to go too far into this, becomes the how. The how is the role of the superintendent. How do they work in tandem together? And again, just to point this out before I get you working in some small groups, because I want you to experience this a little bit here, is that again, school board establishes direction for the district. You define the what. That gets done through the goal setting process. Once that happened, the how gets handed off to the superintendent. And again, you have a committee structure, meaning that you have that internal structure already in place. And what I understand is that you like how that's currently operating because it gives a voice to the teachers and the staff. That gets handed off to them. They understand what the goal is. They get handed what the priorities are that identified. And then they translate the SMART objectives to align to the goals and to align to the priorities that you, the board, have identified. And then through that process, you know, again, they have the latitude to also define that work even further. So now we have a happy marriage between the board's role as well as the superintendent's role and working in that committee structure. Part of what they are going to do is they need to plan systemically, all right? They need to have strategic intent. So for example, part of the process that gets done internally is say, for example, you at the board level determine kids need to have proficiency in technology, not only knowledge, but skills, right? How do we get that done? That's part of what the administrators would do, and sometimes it takes backwards planning. Well, one-on-one -on -one laptops. Kids want to be proficient in, in technology. They need computers. Is that alone going to lend itself to proficiency? The answer to that is no. But what we do need is technology-based learning, that real-world application. But are all teachers able to do that? The answer is no. And so you also have to have professional development that is aligned. This is planning with strategic intent. This is how, again, you at the board level help point direction internally to help develop a plan that all comes together. What happens next, and this is an example, I really like, how, I'm gonna steal yours, by the way, if you don't mind, in my future presentations, because I like how you have your, I, I stole this one, I worked with Una Dilla Valley before, this is what they came up with. They have a links team, teachers, administrators, and that superintendent who developed the actionable plan. This is just what theirs looked like. And again, this is all uh, aligned. Really quickly before we move to the next phase here, because I know you guys are probably tired of listening to me speak, <laughs> but I wanted to lay out, and I'm going to take some questions in a minute, is that you need to have progress reporting. 
And the way that this happens is we take a page from the corporate world called cascading goals, meaning that goals are created at the top level with input from everybody, but then they're deconstructed throughout the system. And how that happens is that you have building level and department level goals, and that's how they're all aligned with one another. But you want to ensure that that information is coming back. So getting to that transparency piece that we talked about before, one of the things that you need to consider is creating that feedback loop. Generally, what we recommend is that you look at your calendar at large, that you have a presentation and planning calendar specific to you, the school board, and you already have something like that in place. You would then determine throughout the year, when are we, the board, going to get input on the progression of those goals? Who's gonna to come to us and talk about data points and how we're moving in that direction? you would have that pre-planned out. The superintendent figures out who is the best person internally to come and present that information to you, the board. So now you're fulfilling that monitoring piece. The other component too that I would suggest if you're not already doing this, as part of the superintendent evaluation process, this would be an informal, and I stress that word informal component. What a lot of boards do is they meet with a superintendent. A lot of them like to do it quarterly. At a bare minimum, they do it midway through the year as an informal check-in. How is the year progressing? How are we working towards our goals? What challenges have we experienced? Did something like COVID derail us? All right, this is good conversation to have. You don't want to wait until the end of the year to all of a sudden get a report and find out you weren't on target because of X, Y, and Z. So now the board is better apprised of that and allows you to better monitor throughout the year and that even adds to filling out the superintendent evaluation. So I just gave you a lot and I understand that and I don't want you to be scared because I just dumped all this information in your lap because you have access to me to, you know, and you also have this on video to go back, and I know all of you are going to watch it time and again and rewind it and bring the kids and popcorn. It's going to be awesome. Nobody wants to see me, trust me. <laughs> so I'm going to pause here because I know I dumped a lot. All right, questions before I, I want to move you into the next, uh, next phase here. So I did Good see your question. hand. So the, the mid-year quarterly check-ins, is that done in public meeting or is that? Depends on the nature of the conversation. Okay. If you're talking at large about district goals, that's going to be public. If you're talking about specific goals related to the performance evaluation of the superintendent, that, you know, again, that gets done in the executive session. Now, what I suggest you do is if you're moving in that direction, you understand what you want to talk about with the superintendent, you call one of our attorneys at NISBA at no cost whatsoever, is this open session or can this be done in the executive session? I always advise just getting some advice beforehand. Other questions? So I, I want to get back to the, the board in, in tasking the district with going out to the community to collect feedback, which yep. we did beautifully this year, yes. right? So the district went out, they collected great feedback. How do you ensure that the feedback we're collecting from the entirety of the district, including internal and external stakeholders, addresses the our overarching goals or our aspirations vision and mission of the district right because to your point of the cave people mm -hmm. right that might or may not share information that's useful there are there is a vision for the district and a mission for the district so how do you make sure that we're aligned in getting the feedback towards those specific vision and mission statements that help then drive the board setting of the goals sure i mean you know and again the purpose of the community survey is to get input into what they would like to see in terms of growth for the district. But there are districts, and I don't remember if it's on here or not, they ask uh, questions very broadly, and again, I don't know if I have it on here or not, just basic questions of, you know, do you feel education within the district has improved or declined? Mm. And they can kind of get a sense of, you know, what is the perception of people feel like that the education's happening here? So again, you know, before you go out with the survey, you want to make sure, you know, what is it that we're eliciting from our community? What is it that we want to collect from them? And if you want to know, are we doing a good job or not, you're going to phrase some questions in there to help guide. You know, others will say, you know, out of, they'll create sort of a list of topics, you know, out of these lists, what are the most important areas for our district to focus in upon? They might have an open-ended question, you know, what do you feel are the most important issues impacting students today? 
uh, sure. whether it be school-wise. And again, you guys would work with the superintendent to determine what's appropriate and what kind of information you, you would like to solicit. So just the data that we have, the last two questions on that survey really lead to the strengths. Mm -hmm. Talks about what things are going well in the schools and then allows for opportunities for community things. What are some things you'd like to see existing in the district in the next five years and how would you like to be involved? So mm -hmm. the uh, administrative team spent some time a few weeks ago going through that data set. The plan is then to have that breaking down to the buildings so the buildings can mm -hmm. have that building-based conversation then open that up to community for community to come in and have that conversation with those results and kind of digest that work. And we started at the board table last meeting in June just initially looking at the high level data set. So that's like the time, like you said, so yeah. important. That's the, that's the process we're looking at for the end of the school year, summer, fall, so that when we get ready for 23, 24, mm -hmm. that energy can be refreshed as we talked about here. And I think we had initially looked at uh, possibly a December date to have our, our team come back together again. And now we will have completed not just the survey, but also those focus groups. Yeah. And then that data set would be there. So as you mentioned numerous times here, I think that would be something I, I listen to the conversation, be interested in kind of following up with that as being a next step. I know we've got a little time left mm -hmm. just saying I see that kind of be in that next very natural step for us to hopefully be with yourself, Jamie, and just kind of processing through that with the SOAR example and, yeah. and walk through. And that's how we kind of debrief the, the data set too and say, yep. okay, what strengths do you see here and what opportunities? And so it, it just presents itself. Uh, and we're very much looking forward to buildings going to do it first with their faculty mm -hmm. and then they're going to open up their building level community conversations. Yeah. So. And so, you know, you kind of have a process in place where you're yep. utilizing that SOAR and so maybe you want to tap into that more. Yep. You know, what I gave you here is just one path. Mm -hmm. And you know you need to determine what's currently working for you that you like, and then how do we make the adjustments? So now the board has you know more of an active role. And you know my you know opinion is that you work with the existing process, but then you modify it where the board is the one creating those district goals in collaboration with the board and superintendent, utilizing that input to guide your thought and processes. And once that has happened, then it gets handed off to the next step of the phase, which becomes more of the, the, the planning phase internally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess and one thing that I would like to point out, because I think it's, it's great hearing this, this whole process, and especially this community involvement piece, because mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things that we've been struggling with. And like the partnership survey that went out was a great start. If we are talking about actually moving into this process, mm -hmm. I think we need to examine if that, because that wasn't developed with board input, yeah. and making sure that we're capturing everything that we needed from the community. And also, that was just distributed by email. So I liked that, that point you talked about, about really doing that extra legwork to make sure that you're tapping into the entire community and reaching those people that may not be picking it up in the email or may not be responding in the email. And how do you let them know how important it is yeah. to respond? So I think if we're going to move forward with this process, it would be important to maybe revisit the community survey a little bit deeper and more comprehensive. So yeah, it's right. all about creating a strategy of how do we best reach those individuals. And again, you know, the, the, the downside is, and I hate to say this, is that there will still be people who don't fill it out because they feel that you should have came directly to their door and, and you know filled it out with them you know but as long as you take those steps and you put and that goes a long way with your district wow you know the district really wants to to gather our input other questions on the process at large all right so what i'd like to do here is i'm going to just shift our attention because i want to give you guys an opportunity to think about how this process actually works out I know we don't have a ton of time left, but I think we got a good understanding of sort of the next steps, and we're going to take a few minutes to do that here. We're actually going to do two things at once. I'm going to have you work within your groups. I'm going to have you guys create a SOAR analysis, and I'll back up to give you those guiding questions that I had before, and I'd like you as a group to kind of fill them out. And then we're going to do sort of a gallery walk to get a sense of what people are thinking of, and then take the next step of, you know, what categories do you see thematically that is not already articulated? And again, this is just to give you a sense of how this process this works to get you thinking about the district at large and how the board then has that role. While we're filling out the SOAR analysis, I know you guys have listened to me ad nauseum and probably need to get up and take a break and just not listen to me for a minute, which I understand. So feel free to go to the bathroom. I'll give you guys roughly about maybe 10, 15 minutes to fill this out. I'm going to come around and give you guys one of these flip chart papers. If you could just create the four quadrants and then collectively as a group fill it out. 
and then we will take a quick gallery walk and then we will go to the next and last phase of today which is to talk about the next steps and what you guys would like to do and we'll make sure that we kind of capture that on paper so you guys have some thoughts any questions about what i'm asking you the SOAR is specific to something in particular or just in this general? is about the district so we're we're in an open Anything. session so we have full range to Anything. talk about the district and what you perceive and again i'll back up my slideshow so i can showcase those questions they will help guide the input Typically of what i'm looking for i'll come around and give you a marker in just a minute data. so designate somebody with good handwriting sure we'll perhaps do. in order and to it would be nice if we had i'll capture that information all right so first and foremost just a little bit of feedback in terms of the experience of you know, filling out the SWOT analysis. You know, what are your thoughts uh, on the experience of doing this? Sore. 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 It was sore. That's so funny. I know it. It's sore <laughs> to do the sore. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, maybe just saying it facetiously, but you know, what made it quote unquote sore? Relation group you created, right? The positivity. Yeah. Just it's frames a positive one. Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, that that was part of what I had to grapple with. We're so, you know, this propensity to want to frame things in a negative, but instead of framing it as a negative, I like the opportunities. You know, what's not working well for us that presents an opportunity for growth? That took me a while to wrap my brain around. But if you're doing the SOAR analysis again, what you want to do here is just kind of frame those guiding questions to elicit the responses that you're looking for. I liked that aspirations was really the flip side of a weakness, right? Yes. That you can see something is something that we're not really great at, or I aspire to do this better. And I think it all feeds back to our perspective and our, our I hate to say it, but mindset. Yeah. Right? Like how we frame the work that we're doing. Are we, are we going to bounce back or are we going to sort of flop and, and let ourselves live in this sad weakness place? Yeah, a absolutely. Positive. You know, and I think that, you know, and that's what I like about the positive inquiry methodology here is that it forces you to look at things from a more positive lens. You know, all, all too often when you're having discussions and when I've done SWOT analyses in the past, you know, to give the example, and I'm, this is not your graduation rate that I know of, I'm just making this up, but a lot of times it's that deflating of, geez, our graduation rate, you know, 82% is garbage, you know. But you reframe that, you know, what is our aspiration? Our aspiration is to have 100% graduation. We want every kid, and that's more of a motivational factor. So when it comes to this, you know, and again, there's different ways that you can think about creating the SOAR. Me personally, I find it to be a time saver to put out a survey monkey and have people individually fill it out. And the great thing about survey monkey is then it then tabulates it all together for you and then to review it in a workshop setting with the notion that if there's things that need to be added that the SOAR didn't initially capture, you have the ability to do it. But I like the conversation that was taking place because I think, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, that's really the value of coming together in a workshop to talk about the results. You have that open, honest conversation around, geez, wh what is this telling us? And then using this information and infusing that into a process to create those goals for you. So just out of curiosity, and again, we're just thinking off the top of our heads. Part of what I would have you guys do, or that you guys can do, depending upon the road that you travel. First thing that you would want to do is you want to use the SOAR to look at the current goal categories that you have. Part of the conversation revolves around, do they still make sense? Are they still viable? Do they need to be updated? But the second question that you guys would consider is, what else are we missing? So just off the top of your heads, thematically, when you looked at this, if we were to classify this into those quote unquote buckets, what might those buckets be? What, what are your thoughts on that? What are some of the categories we might carve out of what we just elicited in our short amount of time filling this out? Communication. Yeah, you could have a goal around communication. You know what, this is an area that we see for opportunity for growth. Therefore, you know, we need to you know, create goals around communication. Community involvement. Yeah, community engagement, community involvement, right? There's another area that we see as opportunity for growth for us. So we need to shine that spotlight. Anything else that you saw on there? Yeah. Recognition for excellence. Mm. 
uh, the recognition piece, you know, you might want to think. Is that, you know, and part of the process, just so you know, is that, you know, when I tend to do this, we will then come to a consensus and I generally have people work on groups. But, you know, what is the general consensus? Sometimes what we find is that we want it to be a goal category, but actually it's language that we can infuse into the goal statement itself. And, you know, I gave you the example in, in the one that I had up here of, uh, if I just go really quickly here, I think I did this in here. So I had student achievement, curriculum, and instruction. Sometimes what happens in coming to consensus, we look at this and we have the conversation. Student achievement, well, we have to have curriculum and instruction in order to you know, help student achievement. Does that belong in that category? And sometimes we decide that, you know what, we need to shine a specific spotlight on curriculum instruction because that's an area we want to make sure that we're, we're, we're um, you know, working towards. So that's part of the process of what you would undergo. Again, I like sending the SOAR analysis out before the workshop. You might decide a series of workshops. One of the workshops would be to come together and to fill out and have a conversation around the SOAR analysis and then have another workshop where all that information is tabulated and then you use it. I mean, that's up to you guys. And so that leads me into sort of my next question here, which is what are those next steps? What do we want to do in terms of tweaking this process? Now, my understanding is that you have sort of the goals and action plans in place for this academic year. And so realistically, what we want to think about is changing the process that would be implemented next year. And I'm, what I'm going to do is just quickly back up and just show all the steps that are part of the process. But more or less, we just want to focus on the ones that pertain to the board itself. So obviously, planning. When I mentioned the idea about a committee that would be in charge of creating a timeline, that would be part of creating, if you deemed it necessary, a community survey. So let's start there in terms of next steps and process. Do you think that a committee is the best route to go? What are your thoughts? Yes. So I'm hearing a lot of yes. For goal yeah, planning? I mean, yes. mm -hmm. Yeah, the committee would be tasked, and again, you, you need to create this through an official resolution at a board meeting. It becomes an ad hoc committee for the purpose of, you know, strategic planning or whatever you want to call it. You create the charge, meaning clear outlines of what you're asking that committee. You would then determine who you would want on that committee. And once that committee has fulfilled its charge, it would then get disbanded unless you wanted to create a standing committee, which then would oversee the process year after year. And that's something you guys can determine. So. My question next, and again, we don't need to get down into the weeds of this because there's a lot more that you guys can think about. I gave you different compositions of what a committee could look like. One composition could be the board as a whole working with the superintendent and others. Another composition could be you have a minority of board members working in collaboration with admin and others. Just to get a general sense, we don't need to make a final decision. I just kind of want to field your thoughts out on what, you're, what you guys are thinking at this moment. The difference is if it's a committee with less than four board members, it doesn't have to be a certain type of a public session, right? So the benefit, can you share a little bit about the benefits? Sure, so here is our general thoughts, okay? There's a question mark of what committees need to be advertised as open meetings, all right? Your audit committee, because it's made up of public officers, yes, that is subject to the open meetings law. Best practice, we highly recommend that all your board committees, and I'm not talking about district committees, that all your board committees be advertised and opened up. It's just a really good practice and it creates that transparency. But the difference being is that if you had a minority of board members, any, any decisions would have to be brought to the board as a whole for consideration. Whereas opposed, that if it's the board as a whole, any decisions that you make are binding. And yes, then, then obviously if it's the whole board, it's a public meeting, which is kind of a given. So, so what are we thought? What are oh, we so thinking? I, I, yeah. I have a question for Fire away. more more planning to plan. Yep. Um, so, with, with the structure of um, a minority of um, board members and other community involvement. Yep. This is still going to setting the goals. It's still the board itself that needs to 
I mean, how, how does this come back to the whole board? I mean, how, how do we have that process to make sure that everyone is getting the appropriate input on the board when we actually make those decisions? So if it's a minority of the board, you would run it like all your committees, you would have at your open meetings, just updates, board, up, you know, committee updates. You know, what is the committee working on? You know, you give the charge and direction to the committee of what they're asking, what you're asking them to do, and then they give you updates. And then any recommendations that come to the full board by a committee, it's the same as any committee. You can either accept it as a whole, you can accept it in part, or you can reject it. It's your, it's your decision. That's the opportunity for everyone to And that's where, that, that's where all then, you know, to, to be honest, some boards decide to do the minority because of the time commitment of bringing the full board together. So I just kind of, we don't need to, like I said, make a decision now. I just kind of wanted to feel out what your thoughts were and what you might, maybe you had a preference off the bat, but maybe we want to put this because this is a larger conversation and this is something you would discuss at an open meeting, which you would put on your agenda. So mm -hmm. question, thought? I guess what I'm seeing is like an advantage of having the whole board involved is that everybody, everybody on the board has an equal voice, but yeah. where it also could come into play is this could be a considerable amount of meetings and extra work, mm -hmm. and it may be that the whole board doesn't want to be able to channel that way, and then is also taking away from other committee work. Yeah. So yes. deciding whether we want to have representatives of the board and are entrusting them to do the work and yep. share it back. So why don't we do this? I think this is a larger conversation that we don't have time for today, but I do want to get your input. Yes? Uh, just one. I, do I hear that it, this, com this type of committee, one of the advantages to uh, uh, cross actually from board to board, since board, you know, we have election every year, the new board member comes every year, sometimes changes, so forth. You could have this standing committee that it's focused on long-term goal, mission, whatever, in it, you know, transcending all from board to board. I mean, you know, the, the purpose of the committee wouldn't be to create the goals. Right. You know, wouldn't be to update mission and vision. They're just the planning. Right. And that's all that they would be. I appreciate that, Jerry. I think yeah. that's an Thank important you. part. Yeah. Because I think that can end fairly tight. I think it can be a representative group. Just here's the here's just the plan. Here's the dates yeah. we're going to meet. Here's the things we're going to do, and then that just stops. Yeah, exactly. And they bring the plan to the board. Here is what we want. Here is the timeline. Yeah. The board has input into that. Well, can we adjust the timeline X, Y, and Z? And you know that's the way that it realistically should work. Okay. So we're talking about a planning committee that may or may not include the entire board, and then the the plans that come out of that committee going to the board to then the board creating the goals as a board and then the goals given to the district that then takes those goals, turns them into smart goals and objectives that are enacted throughout the district. Is that like a... So the planning committee just plays, says, here's how we're going to elicit. And part of the planning committee, and this is the next question and that follows in line with here, is one of the things that you want to commit uh, consider, and this would be something at, at, from the charge or it could be a recommendation of the committee would be do we need to have a community survey now one of the things that i would encourage you to do is that you've already gone out with a community survey i would encourage the board to take a look at that have a conversation uh, and determine whether or not that provided us enough information if you feel that you know what we need to go out with a community survey because the questions really didn't hit the mark of what we want to you know, solicit, then your planning committee would be tasked with the development of a community sur uh, survey. Now my, my guess, and I don't want to speak for Dr. Blanche, that he would be part of this committee. But again, you know, the, the, the survey itself would be undertaken by the district. So that would be a question mark, and again, that would be something for you, the board, to decide as part of the process that you then delegate to the committee. Mm -hmm. So just to clarify to your point, yep. the goals that are set by the board are not set in the planning committee. They are so not I'm, set. I'm just trying to get this like clearly on the record so we're all talking about it, right? So the, the board is gonna set the goals regardless of whether or not there is a planning committee. And then in the interest of transparency, would yep. it then not make sense for us as a board to say, hey, let's make all of our committees open so that we can have as many board members who would like to show up at those meetings. And that way, all of, every, all of this information is shared widely. And to your point, Ife, if we wanted fluid sort of involvement on this committee, you know, maybe Heidi can come and I can't or whatever. And so it, it might be three people. It depends on the people. issue at the you know, time. Yeah. So, well, they want to participate. Is that too much? That might be another well, discussion. I, I, well, hang on. A consistency, I think, if you're, if you're kind of planning yeah. and you're working on next steps, if 
people are rotating through, somebody's there who wasn't part of the last conversation and you lost somebody who was planning from. So I, I can see the value of consistency. On an annual basis, um, it should be consistent. Oh, oh, yeah, but yeah, that yeah. from the trustee perspective, I guess my point oh, year is that year, yeah. if, if we say, look, like you're the person on the committee, I'm making this up, mm -hmm. but I want to step in, I don't ruin open meeting laws by all of a sudden being in this meeting because we've decided as a board that they're all open meetings and they're all going to be publicized and everyone can be there. Mm -hmm. right? so so then yeah. here's, a, here's a caveat. I'm going to jump in real quick, and I didn't mean to, to stifle that, but I just want to make something clear because I, I don't know if I'm misunderstanding what you're saying. So this is point of clarity. If I heard you correct, you would like a minority of board meetings, a minor, minority of board members, it would be the whole board. If they like to be there. So here, it has to be one or the other because you can't have some days where there's a minority of board members and other days there's the full board. No, there needs to be. Basically, the question is whether these committee meeting can open to four members that who are interested. And that's what I was going to address next, yeah. is you need to be cautious, and here's why. If the committee is comprised through, you, through the charter in charge to be a minority of board members, but it is a public meeting, and then additional board members show up that are not part of the committee and become part of the conversation, you now have a full-fledged board meeting. Okay. So generally what our attorneys have said is that, yes, it's an open meeting. If a board member who does not sit on a committee does want to observe, they can. You can have a board member provide information that is not sitting on a committee to the committee made up of a minority, but it's only to provide information and cannot participate in any discussion or any quote unquote recommendation that would then go to the board because if they do participate in that, in, in that recommendation, you're actually creating a binding vote. So you, you just need to be careful. But if you, I'm sorry, so just clarifying, and thank you for this because yeah, I yeah, didn't yeah. understand this before. So if the entire board, if it's not a minority, if it's majority board, does that mean that you cannot run the meeting unless you have quorum? So, yes, you would have to make sure that there was a quorum of board members there. I mean, you know, let me double check that with, with our attorneys to give you, a, a, you know, my gut feeling, and don't quote me on this because I want to make sure that I go back. You know, my gut feeling, I, it is, so there it is right there. It's on, it's on record permanently. This is no different than the policy yeah. you know, committees yeah. on it, right? And that's a subset mm -hmm. of the committee of you know, people on it that are organizing it. But the entire board reviews and as say in, in the policies in there. But you don't need the entire yeah board. to be there. Oh, yeah. in, in the mic, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, we're not all, we're not setting the goals in that in that thing there, but it's a mm -hmm. subset of it. I feel the subset of the board in the committees is a lot more efficient mm -hmm. uh, in getting stuff done, especially if you're going out with the administration, you're going out with uh, the community. It, it I just want to make sure that everyone has a place at the table if they'd like to show up. That's everybody should be able to have, you know, and be able to opine on that, you know, again, like our other committees, using the policy committee right. as an right. example. So if it's all right, I'm just going to jump in for a second. Just following this through, so minority community seat survey right now, done, yeah. yet to be assessed if it's exactly what we want it to be. Yep. And then really some of those next parts, we are going to do focus groups. And so the reality is when we, this planning theme will committee, we'll talk about timeline. I think that's the piece that, that yeah. get that group together real quick. Dates, timelines, pieces, and that work. The end kind of working from uh, kind of the end in mind is we're shooting right now for, I think it's a December 9th, I think is the date, I can't remember, but is a meeting to ultimately get the data here, the focus group data, the timeline all done, back to the collective board to get through all that data set then in December, Jamie hopefully will join us, and we'll then go through that data set. Okay, first determine, is there enough here? Is there enough information here from the community through focus groups, through the survey, through this work to then generate those goals that, that kind of the board and the administration team would be doing at that time? And so I think we've got a reasonable start, the data set there, we're gonna get more through all these focus groups out in each building, community-wide and things like that and then the board at that meeting on the front side will go through that SOAR analysis of the data set itself and then knowing the other qualitative stuff and experiences you bring then that's where we'll, we'll drive to that branch diagram that yep. what comes out of that is going to be those goals so I, I think we're, we're right on target right path then it builds for the 23-24 adjustments and like Jer Jamie said there like we don't have a specific fiduciary goals and responsibility these are all on the academic side of the house I guess I would say so certainly would see some of those other goals that will come out 
But it then it might already be great. I mean, it's a not. It's probably like a 60-minute conversation, just making sure we're on the same page and get dates going. And then we go ahead and survey results. We'll have those. We're going to start processing through the district. The last piece, the board will do the. We looked at the um, quantitative piece. Now we have the qualitative part. There will be that experience in December, and again, work with hopefully Jamie in December to walk us through. Then we're nice frame for after the new year starts, people start getting into some of that thought about now how do we inc uh, incorporate these into the 23, yep. 24 district goals. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, absolutely. So th this it would be you know incorporating the board this year and then moving forward it would be creating that planning, pro uh, planning committee for the purpose of planning process timeline and if you decide that you know we want to do more focus groups, we want to do community surveys, that would all be run through your committee and then the process wise would be outlined very similar to what I said. You know, you would make sure that you use that data, you would conduct the SOAR analysis and then you would come together in a workshop and this is where the board as a whole would be here along with administrators and other key personnel to revisit the goals and then decide what are we missing and that becomes a year after year sort of endeavor. Um, what happens though is that after you guys create you know, your broad goals, those generally have a shelf life. So what boards tend to do is not revisit those goals every year but every other year. That's up for you and that could be something you could task the planning committee to decide. Generally what's going to change year after year are going to be your objectives. Because I think we pointed this out before, change, change takes time. And when you're creating those goal statements, to actualize what you articulated in that goal statement is not going to happen within a year's time span, but the important piece is you're monitoring to make sure that you're moving in that direction. So with that, is there anything that we missed up here that you feel is important in terms of process and next steps? Can I just add to, just to make sure I understand? The yep. So if we're looking at the graphic you have up on the yes. board here, the planning committee, which right now sounds like it's going to be minority board members plus administrators plus whoever else the board deems appropriate to be on this committee, will work on steps one and two, determining what other data resources we need to add to this discussion. And that they will map out the timeline, the process, the members, and whatever, uh, and they'll, they'll determine the steps in which we need, like focus group surveys, uh, and assess the current survey and change that for 22-23 school year if it's deemed necessary. Then steps four, five, and six are full board, and that sounds like that's happening in December, right, where the board will examine the data from the survey, from the focus groups, and whatever else the committee has determined is the are the appropriate Well, this committee sources. is not for this academic year. You're going to implement it for, for the next, next. year. Okay. Correct. Got but it. yes, it, that would be Sorry. for the next Correct. year. Correct. If, 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 yes. The committee is implemented this year for the 23 For the next year. Yes. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Correct. Yeah, so you already have this in place. You know, I think it's a little late in the game to try to start this year. This year for next year. Right, but, but we're modifying it this year to incorporate the board. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. And then next year you would be 100% correct. The planning committee, you would figure out the stakeholder survey. Yep. If the board's direction was we want to revisit mission and vision, you would charge them with creating that as part of the process. The board would create the timeline to determine, you know, when is the board going to do the data dive? When are we going to do the SOAR analysis? You know, when are the goals and objectives going to be carved out? And again, because you're working with the superintendent and administrators, you create that full timeline. Mm -hmm. And so next year, that, that's what that planning committee is tasked with. Next and the objectives year. are not coming from the board. The, the, the objectives are not coming from the board, correct. And again, you're working with that structure you already have in place. The board's job is to create the goals and then it gets handed off where internally the objectives are then aligned to the priorities and goals that the board has set the direction. And again, sometimes year after year you don't need to revisit, you can revisit the goals, make adjustments, you might not have to do a community survey, but that's why you have that planning committee to make those recommendations, so it may make sense to have it be more of a standing committee as opposed to an ad hoc. But that's for you guys to kind of you know, discuss what makes sense to you. So, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, you keep saying next year, and I just want to make sure that I understand. Next year's goals, but the planning committee starts this year to start yeah, getting that data to be able to hand off fictitious date, right? Yes. April to say, here's the goals, and then it goes through the current process, right? 
you know, down to the different you know, schools. Yeah, my, my hope is, is yeah. that on the, I think it's December 13th, actually, I looked at the day, 13th, at that training with Jamie, we'll walk out of that with goals. So that will be when folks come back in January, they are going to understand how do I now infuse this into. Oh, so the, the high level goals should be, it's the December date yes. is the goal to be able to yes. yep. do the 23, 24. Yeah, we walk out with new updated uh, pieces specifically from the board part. That yes. early, okay. Yep. And in the interim, this is where you, the board, discuss the committee. And putting the committee structure in place, not for you know start this process, but yep. to begin the process anew, if that makes sense. Yep. Yep. Okay, sorry, can thank just, you. No, 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 it's good to get clarity, absolutely. Yeah. And can so, I, just, are, I feel like this, this, the survey that was provided for last year is very specific for like, I mean, I, I, I remember talking about this mm -hmm. with you in council, but so it was very specific stuff about like relationship of the school and how we feel about the school. Is that the only survey we're gonna do? For so like that's where planning? I hope on that December meeting when we meet, because at the end- We're not gonna talk about that until December then. Correct, okay. that would be the goal board. To, and what we're looking at is that those last two questions are structured with that SOAR piece, that SOAR, the S part there, what things are going well in the organization, and then what things do you aspire, what things would you like to see in there. Those two are where a lot of the substance and a lot of that meat is, where it's open to give that. And that's when we had those focus groups, which we won't have completed until December. We're gonna have that same process go through with whomever shows up, faculty, parents, and say, let's go through this. What are here? And then we add value to, again, so it's the same thing, like we just went through what's going well in the organization to hear about it, and what opportunities do we have to do better here? That's the piece that's gonna come to the board. It's not complete because we have many more focus groups to do. So okay. then if for whatever reason, December 13th, it's like, that's not enough, then, then we'll have to go out and we'll have to survey again. And my, my hope or my intent is that we'll have enough between the survey as well as all the focus groups we'll still be doing. So again, just because just I see some confusion. Again, we're talking about two different things, but they go hand in hand. Process just for this year is you guys are currently going to run focus groups in December, you as a board will reconvene and decide based upon our current efforts, meaning between the focus groups, the survey that we've already done, the SOAR analyses that have already been uh, you know, distributed, does this provide the board enough to visit our goals to work, go into a workshop? If you decide in December we need to do a community survey because we don't feel like you know what we've currently done has given us enough information you are going to make the decision then okay moving forward after this year once we've gone through this process and you've gone through December and you've created goals that's where you are going to make your changes to the planning process and that's when you then task it to the planning committee who then will for the you know you know next year what is the process that we're going to do this year, uh, next year? But this year it sounds like we already have a process in place that has tweaked it to allow the board to become part of it. But again, next year is where the planning committee then would be taking the reins and making recommendations to the board in terms of process and then creating the timeline and then you know, deciding whether or not you wanna do another community survey in the future. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. So I have two questions. Fire away. So question number one is you keep saying we and you, and this room is inclusive of Lindsay, trustees. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. sorry. That's a little bit I of. I usually talk loudly. <laughs> um, so you keep saying like we and you, and you're talking to a room of both trustees you're as right. well as district um faculty, staff, and leaders, right? So I want to be super clear because yes. one of the things that our board has struggled with historically, just on the record, has been role, right, confusion and, yep. and understanding what our role is. So when you were saying that the board is setting the goals, I just want to be super clear when you're saying you and we who we're talking about. And then to Amanda's point, I just want to follow up because uh, we were talking about the survey that was yep. sent out to the community one of the previous slides was internal and external stakeholders. Now, theoretically, we've gathered some data from internal stakeholders. Mm -hmm. There are questions about the survey, fine, but we don't really have external. So I, I wonder if, because it's July now, it's almost August, but if we do have a couple of months before December, would it not also make sense to just go back and, and do a quick check with some external stakeholders? Or would you suggest you just start anew in the next year? So I think based upon what I heard, and again, you the board can have this discussion and I would encourage you to do that 
in an open session. Yeah. You know, based upon the current plan for this year, meaning what we intend, and again, I'm using the word we as district, meaning spearheaded by the superintendent, creating those focus groups and bringing folks in, looking at the information from the survey that has already been, you know, distributed, and then looking at relevant data points. You, the board, you. would then decide, is this enough? If you, the board, decide that we need to go out this year with a community survey, because we, the board, don't feel like we got enough input from external stakeholders, then you're gonna work in, in collaboration with the superintendent to go out. Now, my understanding is that, you know, the December date is going to be the determiner. Got it. And that's where you, the board, at an open session would then make that decision, because if you're going to be doing it in January, you have a runway to go out and make those efforts happen. Does that make sense? Is that clarifying? Again, I want to be crystal clear. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> I know. It, it, it's I keep a, asking a hundred times. No, 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 no. It, it, it's you. good. It's good. You know, and I, I know we're a few minutes over, but I'm, I'm happy to stay and, and do this with you guys here. Yeah, no, because I'm a little confused with that because I would think if we were establishing the planning committee, um, then, so we've got this December date out there. If we're talking about possibly having a workshop, possibly yep. having you back to help us with that goal setting process yes. in December, but then we get to that point and are all of a sudden like, oh, well, actually we don't have enough information. What can we really accomplish in that session other than saying, okay, well now we need to get a survey and then we'll do this again. That's so what, what so, I'm wondering is can't the planning committee, if, we're, if the board decides to establish the planning committee. But this is not for this event. year though. I just wanna make that clear. I think that what, what we've been saying here is that this committee is going to be implemented in 2023. Oh, but why couldn't why it be implemented sooner? Because the reason that, and again, what I have understood thus far is that we have a process that's already been put into motion. Yeah, and Jim, I think for, oh, sorry. Go right ahead, yep. Just on that, that uh, piece up in the front, I think it will be a, a quick committee meeting up front. In particular, I'm interested in clarifying the timeline with the policy for what we're doing this year. So the, yeah. everybody knows what those focus groups dates are going to be, when they're taking place, so hopefully they can attend the community ones and things like that. So I see that part being there. The part I'm struggling with redoing, uh, doing another survey part is, is that um, the ball has, has really been rolling. And so we've, as at a, a full ADCO, we debriefed that data set. We did the initial one in the spring. We have the learning office is bringing 90 or so folks together in just a couple of weeks to go that data set will have probably at least a half a dozen or eight focus groups that are established. And so I'd be very surprised if the board's not going to have enough data conversation to make a reasonable decision with this moving forward. I don't, I don't think there's anything magical that's going to come out of another survey. I'm going out and doing some focus groups out of the community as well, too. We're going to invite focus groups in through Tuskegee University to come in, anybody and everybody to come in and look at the results and let's talk about that. So I, I have to, based upon our you know, previous experience, believe we'll have a, a, a good, good representation, and we're going to be meeting with the student body at the high school to get their voice involved in it. So, there's just right. a, a lot. Yeah. So I guess my concern is that if there's particular things that the board knows that we might be looking for and needing for that goal setting process, mm -hmm. how do we ensure that that's part of the focus groups? If it wasn't, we know what was on the survey. If there's something, and it, maybe we need to yeah. have this board discussion maybe at one of our meetings in August, but um, just making sure that as those, as those focus groups and things are coming forward, if the board, and it could be just done by the board and not having to be the planning committee, mm -hmm. but if there's something that we, are, we know we're going to be looking for in December, making sure that that's being captured in these yeah. focus groups are happening. Because yeah. you've planned, the administration yeah. has yeah. planned those and what's being discussed, the board hasn't had a voice in that. So making sure yeah. that we're part of that for this year yes. before, we're, you know, before we kick into the whole And that's what I think with, with Nick and Brooks to the committee where I'd like to connect with the committee on that. Yeah. And so what start it earlier. And the intent is <clears throat> basically at those focus groups, much like today, we'll do the S and the O with those focus groups. What strengths the people here and feel in this experience, what opportunities are, and that, that will be then all aggregated up 
to bring forth to the board line. Instead of making, look, we've got eight times, 10 times, here's the buckets that were developed each one there, and then that's a data set that the team will go through. But that's a part I hope to connect with the planning committee just on that so everybody knows, here's the meetings, here's who's at those meetings, and here's the general mm -hmm. deliverables so out of those meetings. But the planning so it's committee for next year. No, 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 no. The planning just, committee just saying start one this now. year would be an, almost like an audit and, and representative the board right. to say, hey, that, look, Ray and team is absolutely ready for the November 9th date or whatever the date is, yeah. right? The December date. You know, they, they should just be part of that process. Yep, yeah, we're, we're taking a look at it. They're in good shape. Yeah, we should be fine with yeah. doing the planning. And I think it's going to be an abbreviated piece. And like the James said, then next year, that group will really expand. The response was, okay, mm -hmm. are we okay with the survey? Well, we want a new survey. How about those focus groups? Did we miss something there? Mm -hmm. That's where it's really going to expand. This year, is, I think, would be literally, I think we could knock it out in the meeting, just making sure we're all on the same page. Yeah. Uh -huh. The board gets the information they're looking for out of these focus groups. I said, here's what we're looking to present to you. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah. Gives us a chance to modify that. Oops, before we do that. So, like, at an end of August, right in the beginning of September, for us to meet as a subcommittee would, would be fantastic. So when we go out in the field and we have hundreds, if not thousands of conversations, that what comes back is going to be what will give the Board of Mission to act. We're looking at the strengths and opportunities coming back. That's the, the aggregated framework. Mm -hmm. Can I ask that maybe we share the data in a, in a sooner way than December, right? And I think that that's well, what you were getting well, we, to before. Yeah. Is, is there a way in the no. dashboard to share as ongoing as you're collecting it so that it's I would, not all of a sudden surprise? I, don't, I, don't, I would say I need to get the report completed. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, so I'm, I'm cutting you off because yeah, I think we should probably have this in public conversation. Let's come up with the committee. Let's yeah. go over the charter and then let's have that committee determine as far as it. Great, great. All right, there's a committee. Yeah. We've talked to Ray and mm -hmm. here's what we're going to get a timeline beforehand or whatever it might be. But yeah. I don't think yeah. we saw that. I here. agree with Ray. I think the committee can be set up anytime. Yeah. We don't really have to define this for this year, for next year. That committee, hopefully, it's a you yeah, know sure uh, long-term committee that is going to look out for committee charter for the future. That. So we can start early, and earlier we start, the earlier we get the board involvement in this process. Mm -hmm. That's whole you know discussion we have today yes. is to achieve that uh, objective. So, so just so, if it operates this way, that I've heard. August, and then what we'll do is I'll connect with Nancy. We'll get that on one of our August meetings mm -hmm. to establish the committee here. Mm -hmm. That's set, establish the charge of what that committee is. Yep. And then we'll, you will let us know who's on that piece, and we'll get right on those dates right away. And then we'll just start knocking down some of those quick things for this year, and obviously next year that, that's going to expand a little bit. Yeah, correct. And actually, one other in, in favor of the subcommittee, it makes it much more digestible and easier for Ray and team to communicate with and the broader yeah. board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was good. Uh, that was? Yeah. All right, so I, I think we got a, a solid plan in place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I commend you for the, your excellent questions because having crystal clarity is extremely important as you're moving forward. I think that you know we, we, we have everybody's input into this and we got some great next steps. Um, any other questions before, you know, you guys probably want to rush out of here and go get something to eat, but yes, yeah, because <laughs> my stomach is grumbling here. So I'm going to make my, my closing remarks short and sweet here, but I just want to make sure, is there any other lingering questions? <laughs> All right, fantastic. So listen, you know, we did a lot of work today. Um, I, I hope that you know, I edified you in terms of process-wise, and it seems like we have some great next steps. Thank you guys very much for inviting me out. If you have questions along the way, something jumps to mind, my card is right in that folder. Feel free to call or email me. I'm very accessible, and I get back to you as quickly as possible. And if you would like me to come back um, you know, to help you guys, I'm December more than 13th. willing to do that. December 13th. <laughs> December 13th. I will put that on my calendar. We'll reconnect. So thank, thank you guys you. very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Very thank you. Much. Yes. Can you close us down for the meeting? Oh, I'm uh, what's the word? Where is it? Hang on. Sorry. Uh, hang on. Sorry, everyone. Uh, be it resolved, the special meeting of the Board of Ed be adjourned. Motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Stained. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So